Welcome to Sharon Gilbert to Immunity Group Australia's podcast. Sharon is not an ordinary mom. She's a food allergy superstar mom, a trailblazer in Australia's food allergy community and globally. She's a mom to Charlie who has been suffering from life-threatening food allergies since birth. Um, they went through an OIT journey and she will tell us a little bit about that. They have a business in the food allergy space which advocates for inclusion. Um, let's hear from Sharon. Sharon, welcome to our podcast. Thank you for having me and what an introduction. <laughs> that was wonderful to hear. <laughs> there is so much to be said about you. It's so beautiful to wake up in the morning and see some of Charlie's videos, which are full of hope, um, which give this message of inclusion to all children and normalize food allergy talk. Um, before we kind of go deeper into this conversation, can you tell us a little bit about Charlie and how did your life change um, before the diagnosis life and then after food allergy diagnosis life? What was the main change for those parents who may not understand what impact food allergies can have on parenthood? Yeah, and I think um, you've summarized what our, I guess our vision, our mission is here um, for Charlie and I and for our business, Charlie Safe Treat Box. It's about providing hope and living with hope rather than in fear. So I'm really glad that that message is coming across. Uh, so Charlie is now 12 years old and uh, he's my first born child. Um, and he, looking back now, had a lot of uh, signs of what would be a food allergy child. So um, for the first few months, uh, he was breastfed, but he um had consistent crying, you know, like a colic baby. He had eczema and sensitive skin. And uh, we found out through trying to introduce dairy for the first time when he was about six months of age uh, that he had food allergies too. So even at six months of age, when I tried to give him some dairy, he already knew it was dangerous and closed his mouth and shook his head side to side to say no, even though every other food we'd introduced prior to that uh, he had loved, this one he knew was dangerous. And so when I just put a little uh, little bit on his lip of yogurt, um, he, I thought he'll lick it off his lip and he'll like the taste and, you know, off we go and we can add um, some more food options in for him. But that little bit on his lip meant that he broke out in hives in a minute or two all over his face. And at that point, I knew nothing about food allergies, nothing. <laughs> I, uh, I took a photo and I sent it to my husband, who is a, a GP, he's a doctor. And I said to him, I just tried to give Charlie some yoga and this happened. What should I do? And he sent a text message back and he said, look, he's probably allergic to dairy. Don't give him any more. And I still remember I texted back and I said, what does that mean? What's allergic to dairy? And wow. so when he got home, he said, um, look, it just means, yeah, um, it's okay. They usually outgrow dairy by three or four years of age, but uh, just don't give him anything with dairy. And I said, but what does that mean? Like no cheese, no, and we started going through, yeah, no milk, no cheese, no yogurt, no cream. And I remember saying to him and thinking to myself, how is this going to be possible? Like there's so much food that has dairy in it. He also said, we'll probably need to book him in to see an allergist and uh, they can do skin prick testing on his back and see um, just to confirm that he's allergic and see if there's any other allergies. And, you know, it's not that easy just to book in and see an allergist next week. Uh, so we were able to find one um, who was closer to our home, but it was still a three-month wait at that point to see this allergist. So when Charlie was nine months old, uh, we had the appointment with the allergist who did the skin prick test on his back and it showed um, allergies for dairy, egg, peanuts, some tree nuts, possible soy allergy, possible sesame allergy. That's a lot of foods. That's a lot for, you know, a mum <laughs> where this is their first child who's learning all of the things of motherhood. <laughs> And to be given that that stress on top of it is um, it's hard to imagine. But you go from one day not 
knowing anything about allergies to the next day it being all consuming. And so for us, it really was with that many food allergies um, and you don't know anything and you leave the appointment still not knowing anything really apart from to avoid those foods. So I think given his age, we weren't even prescribed an EpiPen um, and because he hadn't had an anaphylactic reaction, that was the other We're reason. We're living in this fear of, of a reaction yeah. without first aid medication. Um, so uh, I was due to go back to work as well when Charlie was 12 months old. Uh, so we were finding a daycare centre, um, A, that had availability, and then B, that would be uh, allergy aware. And by chance, there was a new daycare that opened close by who had spots available, and they were uh, egg and nut-free centre. So for Charlie, the only allergen we had to worry about was dairy. And I think in between um, when we had the testing with the allergist and when he started at daycare, we had been told to try and introduce soy and sesame at home. And we had done that successfully. So he wasn't allergic to those ones. Um, so it was still difficult because at, at daycare, there's a lot of kids that have um, milk, cow's milk in their bottle to drink or in food that they're eating. Um, and so there was a lot of procedures we had to put in place with the daycare centre to make sure that Charlie was as safe as he could be. Um, I would still get a call once a fortnight, once a week, where I had to come and pick him up because he was having, um, you know, a mild allergic reaction. He'd had contact with something. Maybe it was another child who dribbled, you know, on the floor and then Charlie had crawled yeah. along there or touched something and that's just how easy it could happen. So um, unfortunately he did have some anaphylactic reactions from daycare because changes of staff and things happen. Um, and then, uh, you know, we went to a kinder um, who fortunately the kinder teacher, her adult son's best friend had grown up being allergic to dairy, egg and nuts. And so she was well aware of what needed to happen at the kinder for Charlie, uh, which was great. And her husband was allergic to avocado. And then when we started Charlie um, through the school, uh, he was in what was called pre-prep. So I guess it's their pre-kinder. And I had a lot of conversations about his allergies, but we... Um, I guess, found out that sometimes you can explain things over and over, but the other people still don't understand the severity of allergies like dairy. Peanuts or tree nuts, they understand, but dairy can be difficult for them to grasp. And so one time um, I picked Charlie up from school and I could see straight away something wasn't right. And when he came over, he said, I'm not feeling right. I'm a bit wheezy. So we gave Zyrtec. We went into the bathroom there. We had water wipe and wiped his face down. And um, the teachers came to check if everything was okay. And I said, I'm not really sure. Um, I'm not sure what's happening. And it was only when we got outside, Charlie explained to me, uh, they did an experiment in the classroom today with milk. Nobody had told me. And even when we were in the bathroom after giving Zyrtec, the teachers still hadn't mentioned it. And so when I went back to ask them about it, they said, yes, we, we did, but we made sure you know, appropriate um, safety precautions were in place. But obviously it wasn't. And so Charlie ended up having a reaction. And um, I think that was the introduction to us knowing that going through school, it was a very different environment from daycare or kinder for people to understand um, food allergies. And so that was more the catalyst for actually to really seriously start looking into treatments that were available overseas. So what led you to um, actually find, how did you make a decision about a treatment? I had been on um, Facebook groups at that time. Uh, I, I can't even remember now <laughs> how they were, but there was allergy Facebook groups. And through that, I started to see discussions of a treatment that was available in the USA for people with food allergies. And then there were certain groups that were made that you could join and people would share their experience of um, what food allergies they had, um, starting the treatment, um, you know, tips, experience, um, 
as their child actually moved along through the treatment, what they could now tolerate compared to the beginning. And I remember I kept on, I think it was probably every night, saying to my husband, oh, my goodness, look at this family. They they couldn't have this to start with and look what they, this child is having now. And we kept on asking, why isn't this available in Australia? I wonder if it's going to come here soon. How many years ago? So we, would, we would talk to our allergist um, and other people in the medical field and they would say, oh, it might or no, or it's too risky. Um, and we just get kept on getting told, yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't going to happen in Australia anytime soon. And Charlie was how old by then? Oh, well, when we eventually moved to the US, he was five at the time. So this was probably from when he was about two or three. So at this point, he hadn't outgrown milk and egg. Like, you know, we get sort of told um, at that age, well, they'll probably outgrow it. So you'll be fine. It'll just be the nuts that statistically they tend to hang around for life. Um and then when he was three or four years of age and he hadn't outgrown milk or egg, we got told, well, you know, the percentages have changed, the data's changed. Um, I think it was, you know, 50 or 60% will outgrow it by um, five or six years of age. And then, you know, a year later, the data was changing again from what we were told. And it was, well, um, you know, 80% will outgrow milk and egg allergy by, I think it was 16 years of age. And so for us, we we were sort of thinking, well, this is this is becoming riskier as you as they get older and start going to school and you're placing them in somebody else's care. Right. How there has to be a better way. There has to be another solution. And um, so for us, that that um, event at school where Charlie had the reaction to milk was the catalyst for us to start really looking into the possibility of doing this treatment overseas ourselves. And I think just prior to that, um, I had noticed in one of these Facebook groups that there was a mum from Australia who had relocated to the US and was doing treatment for her child. So I knew it was possible <laughs> that you could be based in Australia and move to the US and do it. I just didn't know how. And also the other, the other um, challenge was that there was Charlie who was um, five, Arnold was three years of age and Evelyn was 18 months old. And my husband would not be able to move overseas for that period of time due to his work. And so um, we sort of said we will do it, but we'll probably wait till the children are all a little bit older. Uh, but when things like this happen at school and you realise, well, what's the what's the risk of not doing it as opposed to what's the risk of doing this treatment? And um, so I was in contact with another couple of uh, Australian allergy mums who had moved overseas as well to the US to do the same treatment um, with the same allergist. <laughs> and uh, so I knew they were there and they had older children and we had a um, Skype call with Dr. Jones, it was Skype back then, to chat through if we wanted to come, is there a wait list, what, what do we need to keep in mind, what other questions do we need answers for. And after that, we decided um, we just need to do it now. And Dr. Jones had said, yeah, well, we, I think it was August, we had the Skype call, and he said, we've got a spot in October if you want to come. So wow, very soon. He did say, you know, it is Utah, it will be winter. Sometimes it's better to wait till it's warmer weather just for child um, children coming down with colds and those sorts of things. It can delay the treatment, but, you know, it's up to you. So we decided um, let's just do it. Charlie hasn't officially started school yet and um, there's other Australian families there too who are both from Victoria um, so we had to organize, yeah, the medical visas, um, accommodation, car hire, getting warm clothes, uh, notifying the school. Um, and yeah, before you knew it, we had our passports done, medical visa approved, 
And um, we were on the plane heading over to the US with the hope that this could be um, life-changing treatment for Charlie. And it certainly was. Um, and before sort of we delve into the success of it, um, I wanted to ask you about mental health challenges which you faced on this journey, um, mostly alone with three children overseas. Um, definitely ends justify the means. But what was the most challenging part mentally for you as a food allergy mom in that period of transition? I think um, I get asked this so many times. How did you do it? <laughs> Particularly when other when other families go through the treatment, um, and then they they are aware that we moved to, or I moved overseas with the three children and their age, and we weren't doing the treatment for one allergen either. It was multiple food allergies. Um, I don't know. All I know is that's the strength of a mother's love that we can do hard things when it comes to our children, when it comes to protecting them, when it comes to keeping them safe, when it comes to giving them the best future possible, we will go to extraordinary lengths and find the strength to do that. And so I never thought um, it won't be possible. I knew it would be hard. And um when we were, well, actually, even before we left, sometimes you just know um, God, the universe, whatever, has your back on it because those signs are there. And, you know, getting getting the medical visas went reasonably easy. Um, the night before we flew to the US, so, you know, uh, Five of us, because my husband flew over, he stayed, I think it was the first week to help us get set up before he had to fly back. Um, five people um, we put in to get an upgrade. We had enough points to get an upgrade on the flight. We had five tickets the night before upgraded to business class, flying wow. from Melbourne to LA. Wow. What are the chances? <laughs> It's a good sign. Definitely. It was like, good sign. <laughs> okay, well, that's, that's a good way to start the trip. Um I remember when we got into LA airport and, uh, you know, there was huge queues. We got taken off into another, you know, speed queue, probably because we had um, little children, but we uh, got approved because you, you've got your medical visa, but then you're not really sure what you'll get until you've arrived in the US. And so the person we had through customs was really lovely, interested in the treatment we were going to be doing for Charlie. And so we got approved for 12 months. Um, I know other Australian families only got six months and then had to reapply. When you at, at the entry point, wow, yeah. wow. Um, we decided to um, hire a car when we were there. A lot of families bought a car. We hired a car because um, it was more expensive, but there was concerns of well, if there was ever a car accident, I've got three children with car seats, <laughs> um, and if I need to go and buy a new car because there's a car accident. I can't do that with three kids <laughs> where if we've rented a car um, and something happened, we could get a replacement really easy. So the car we ended up was this brand new version model. <laughs> like it was just amazing. Um, there was that, I think the day we arrived and we pulled up to where we were staying for the accommodation, um, by chance, one of the other allergy mums was standing out the front as we just drove in. She was talking to a maintenance person there. So she was there to greet us, you know, uh, take us up to where our apartment was. And then um, there were so many other things of people just appearing and helping throughout our whole uh, nine months. We ended up being there, nine months stay. And I swear every single day, whenever we would be out, we would get out of the car or something would happen. We'd look down and there would always be a penny on the ground. And you know the saying, see a penny, pick it up all day long, you'll have good luck. <laughs> I swear every day we found a penny and we were like, there's our good luck for the day. Um, yeah, but we met um, beautiful families uh, based in the US and so many other Australian families who arrived after us as well, um, all Families with multiple food allergies coming from Australia, you know, the the real sensitive kids, the multiple food allergies who 
um, the risk of just trying to go through life via avoidance was just far too dangerous. Um, this was our hope. And um, we all supported each other through being located in another country, um, through our kids going through this journey. Some were doing homeschooling. Um, some hadn't started school yet. Uh, but just the timing of all of that, of us all coming together and um, we were actually, most of us were staying in the same apartment complex too. So our kids every afternoon could play together. Allergy families could chat. The parents could chat. Um, and for a lot of us, it was the first time that we actually met other food allergy families. And you could talk and you realised we were all living the same allergy life. Um, where up until that stage, many of us had never, we, we'd never met other allergy families and our child had always been the only allergy child in you know the daycare or the kinder or the school so far so it's amazing so in the middle of Utah you meet other food allergy parents from Australia in an Aussie compound seasons of Leighton I think it yes was. yes <laughs> exactly exactly so um I think that's how I I got through it with the mental side um I was always looking for those little um symbols of hope throughout the journey and they were always there and then we were supporting each other in terms of the Australian allergy community having to move overseas to do the treatment because it wasn't available in Australia and the same story from many of those families of what they'd been told by their allergist was your child is too sensitive to do the treatment um, many were told you are negligent if you go over there and do the treatment um, and one of the other surprising things was how many of those Australian families had been told they were allergic to certain foods in Australia and they went to um, the US and Dr Jones had a different interpretation of their allergies and was confident to do food challenge for a number of them, uh, which he said, we need to do this because there's no point doing OIT if you're actually not allergic to the food. And so many of these families passed foods, food challenges. They weren't actually allergic to everything on their list, which is amazing, but shocking and frightening as well that these families have been avoiding foods and living in fear of foods that they actually weren't allergic to. So um, they still had plenty of other real food allergies and it just meant that when uh, they were going through the treatment, they were now only doing doing treatment for ones they were actually allergic to. Um, yeah. That's a huge quality of life improvement pretty much. Oh, yes. Well, many of them said we, we, we're we happy to go home now just with that. Like that was, <laughs> that's, you know, that's just a, a huge positive already. And if that's all we get from this um, moving overseas, we're actually okay with that. But let's see if we can, yeah do this treatment and get some um, some more hope and some more freedom of how we have to live, yeah. As a, as a food allergy mom who has gone through this treatment successfully, um, now we have several um, OIT options in Australia. In a private setting, there is also a public um, rollout for a peanut for infants, but a lot of mums I've seen on social media are desperate for, for advice. Um, what would your one or two pieces of advice be for the, these parents who are about to embark on an OIT journey or who are already doing it um, but are facing those sort of so, social and mental health sort of challenges, fears, doubts? What would you say to them? Um, you can do it. it. It's hard, but so is living food allergy life and complete avoidance. It's hard. Um, this level of hard will bring um, safety, freedom, choice um, options for you. The life of complete avoidance doesn't bring those things. So for me as an allergy mum, I wanted to invest my time, my energy, <laughs> into something that would bring a positive outcome for this food allergy life and putting it into complete avoidance. Um, it, 
you know, there was no positives from that, apart from Charlie not having a reaction. Um, but that was full um, fear-based living. And doing this treatment, uh, it's not full fear-based living. There, there's still a fear of allergies because this treatment isn't a cure. Um, and as I've said to you before, you end up having a um, healthy respect for food allergies now. That's a massive concept I wanted to interview you about originally. What is yes. a healthy respect for food allergies? Yes. For you? What does it mean for You're you? not um, fully fearful of food allergies anymore. You understand them on a different level. You understand all the things in the environment around that can influence um, your child's body, what can mm, make a reaction happen and what can make it worse. Um, you have a greater understanding of food allergies, but there's a healthy respect now. You don't live, you know, in full fear of food allergies where they have total control of your life. You've worked to gain some of that control back, but you also know... <laughs> that food allergies are unpredictable and that doing this treatment, there's definitely protocols you need to follow because when you don't, food allergies will tell you you're off course <laughs> and uh, we've worked you out. Um, but you you start living a life where food allergies are still there. They're, they're sitting at the table with you, um, but they won't have the control that they did before. You've actually taken some of that control back. Um, we still take our EpiPens everywhere. We never leave home without them. We'll always have multiple. Um, Charlie's blood test results and skin test results have reduced significantly across all of his food allergies, some more than others, and maybe that's a sign of his body actually outgrowing them as well with H. Um, and we hope still that with dairy and egg, he will outgrow it at some point in time and it'll just be the nuts then that remain as his food allergies. Um, but I think doing the treatment has given us such a greater understanding of food allergies and things where a weakened immune system or um, if he's dosing and he's got a cut in his lip or he's got a tooth that's come out and the gum is more exposed and how allergens can get into the body in multiple ways and cause a reaction, um, you know, exercise, uh, increased heart rate. Um, what are just some other things that we realise they can influence when he's dosing every day? Um, if he could have an allergic reaction or not. Um, well, he's also willpower. You mentioned before that there is obviously Dr. Jones's protocol is very strict on the maintenance dosing as an essential component, but there is sometimes fatigue by the children or expressions of fatigue. How do you manage that? Yes. And, um, you know, going through the, um, the initial period with the escalation of the doses before you get to maintenance, that's a, a journey in itself. And it's a real... Um, a mind battle because for these kids who are going through it uh, typically they will through their allergy senses they've got this other sense they can identify if the food might have their allergens and it's dangerous and um, now they're having to eat it and they're having to tell their brain they need to put it in their mouth <laughs> and it will be okay and so as a mum you're also saying we need to do this because it's going to keep you safer in the now and in the future. Um, you know, the, the nurses are here, the doctors are here, like the people have done this before. Um, that's a whole mental exercise in itself. And then you go home and you have to do the dosing at home and there's the protocol around it. Um, and over time you start to see how the body is changing and reacting to introducing those allergens and that um, again you're looking for those signs that it is actually working wow you couldn't tolerate this amount before and now you can or the last time you had an allergic reaction was to less than you know this current dose that you're on and um, so for us that was always looking at 
what what um, each level of increasing the doses meant and that you might have passed where foods that say it may contain traces would now long, now no longer be um, a danger. Um, and then products where it might be baked in a cake or something, you could actually start to have a bite of that and it wouldn't be a danger. Um, it's all liberating. You get to, yeah, you get to where, because not everybody wants to get to um, the top level of um, graduating either. Some people are just happy as long as, if they came across traces of the allergen, we're happy to stop there because that's where our sort of tolerance level is. Um, but other people say, no, we want we want to go um, to the sort of top level of graduation so that they can start to eat products that have those allergens outside of their daily dose, which is mind-blowing because it's like, really? Couldn't that be possible? But it is. Um, and so there was plenty of times where Charlie didn't want to dose and he didn't want to have a bigger dose because you knew next week for us, we'd be going into the clinic and the dose would get bigger. Um, but we'd have to focus on why we were doing it. Um, things that he had been able to try or do now that weren't as dangerous as prior to the treatment. Um, then once he actually got up to um, the graduation part and being told by Dr. Jones, you know, you can go and eat this product now and Charlie being able to try a food that he's never had before for the first time and that he would have no re reaction. How was and that for you? How did you feel that first? I think, yeah, that's the that's really hard for the mind to be looking, going, they should be having it, but they're not. But how is this working? Why are we not offering this in Australia? Like I'm watching it working but we hear from the allergists back home, it won't, it doesn't work. But have they seen this? Have they actually gone overseas and watched families go through this treatment? Um, how, how can people say this isn't working when it is? So um, what happened when you came back and you showed those results to the, the, the previous allergists that you saw? Were they amazed? Well, the difference was when we came back, Charlie's previous allergist um, was no longer working in Australia. He'd moved back to um, the country he was originally from. And so we were given a new allergist <laughs> and I knew this new allergist um, was not in favour of uh, OIT in the US. And um, I wasn't sure how Charlie's first appointment would go but I said to Charlie we need to do it because um, we need to see where your results are now but also we need to talk to people in Australia to show what is working overseas and that they can start seeing it through their results and through Charlie's results that this this is possible this is possible in Australia and start the conversation of why aren't we doing it? Um, yeah, so we we had a really long appointment actually for his first one with his new allergist um, who was shocked, like, really? So he's, how much is he dosing now every day? Okay, and he's not having a reaction. <laughs> um, and, you know, even things with his, um, his egg dosing, when we were on the plane flying from Melbourne to LA, he was so sensitive to egg that they started heating up the breakfast and my husband and I could smell the egg in the cabin. And we looked at each other, you know, to say, okay, well, they'll, they'll be serving egg. We'll have to be cautious of, you know, if we get up and we need to use the bathroom and, you know, wiping down the handle and, you know, people could have touched things. Um, but they hadn't even started serving it. And Charlie's nose started to run. His eyes started to water. He started rubbing his eye because it was itchy. He didn't know what eggs smelt like because we didn't have eggs at home. <laughs> and here we are on a plane between Melbourne and LA and he's starting to have a reaction, not because it's even been served to people. Nobody's eaten it yet, but it's in the air from them heating it up. Um, that's how sensitive he was. And we'd been at some school events 
in the year prior where they had, um, you know, a Mother's Day, Father's Day breakfast and, you know, bacon and eggs getting cooked in the morning and we had gone, he didn't eat any food there, um, but he came home with me because he had hives on his back from just what was in the air. Of course, when we flew back from um, completing the treatment, he had no reaction. It didn't matter now if it was in the air, um, it wasn't going to be dangerous to him. So just speaking to the allergist about how sensitive he was to now what he was consuming every day and also products he was eating outside of his daily dose that he wasn't having a reaction to. Um, so I know it triggered a lot of um, interest from his allergist here, um, but I think Australian medical systems a lot more complex perhaps or I don't really know um, why there's hesitations of of offering it or asking other countries who are offering the treatment, um, asking them the questions and, and collating the data and the best practice and implementing it here. Um, there is definitely published data on this and, and, you know, guidelines in Europe and America, even Croatia has been doing it for nine years. That was their opinion. Yes. So. Well, I think the one consistent answer we got was, well, there was, they tried to offer this treatment in Japan and somebody died um, and that's why we are not doing it. And so when we would ask for further information of what actually happened with this case in Japan that apparently everybody was basing their decision on, nobody could give any further information. <laughs> It was. It had just been passed along that, um, yeah, somebody had died from the treatment, and it's like, but people are dying from not having the treatment, and people are having to restrict their life so much from not having the treatment. And and when I'm talking about this, it's not just people who have a peanut allergy, because they. I think now there's so much awareness in the community for these people with a peanut allergy, um, and they can relatively live a full life there's still risk there absolutely and charlie's got peanut allergy um but for a lot of these kids coming through who are multiple food allergies the risk for them and the impact on how they can live their life is enormous um why would we not offer them this treatment when it can save their life absolutely. and not just save it but improve their quality of life um, yeah. And we're also beneficiary of um, Dr. Johnson's international protocol implemented in Australia. And my daughter is now taking egg for her yeah. lunch until yeah. two years ago, we had anaphylaxis to egg and yeah. hospitalization. So it's, it's really amazing how it works in practice. Um, of, of course, it's in a private setting, not in the public hospitals, which we were mm -hmm. advocate for, of course, to be. And mm -hmm. you have become in the last seven years, one of the, um, loudest voices in Australia in the allergy community, um, mm -hmm. creating Charlie's Safe Treat Box, which is such a great way of promoting food allergy awareness and safety. Tell us a little bit about Charlie's Safe Treat Box. Yes, so we um, we officially launched Charlie's Safe Treat Box two years ago, but the idea for Charlie's Safe Treat Box um, first came when we were in hospital after Charlie had had an anaphylactic reaction. And he had, between the ages of two or three, there was um, a few anaphylactic reactions within close uh, timing of one another. Um, two had been from daycare and one was a failed egg challenge in hospital that re went really bad and required overnight hospitalisation for Charlie. Um I don't know if it was the first, the second or the third one. I think it was the first one where it was our first time in hospital. And as you know, when you've had an anaphylactic reaction and you, um, if you get an ambulance to hospital, once you're in hospital, you're there for a minimum of four hours while they um, observe you to see if you might have a second reaction. So we were in hospital. Uh, Charlie was feeling a lot better after EpiPen. And um, he was starting to feel hungry. <laughs> and, you know, a two or three-year-old um, gets a bit restless and once they're hungry, you know, they need food. And so I spoke to the nurses and said, is there something safe that you could um, find for Charlie to eat? So we went through what their food allergies are and they really um, 
found it difficult to find something that was safe and that was labelled. And it really um, surprised me because it's not like Charlie was the first child with food allergies who had ended up in hospital because of anaphylaxis. Like this is happening frequently. Why isn't the hospital prepared for this? So they managed to find um, it was a so-called soy prima and Charlie had had this particular milk before um, and a lemonade icy pole. And I think even on the lemonade icy pole it had may contain peanuts or tree nuts, but um, it was like, okay, he's had this lemonade ice pole before. They should be fine because the last thing we wanted was to give him um, a new food that he hasn't tried before and that he has another anaphylactic reaction and we end up in hospital for longer. And at some point during that stay, I said to Charlie, gosh, I just wish there was a vending machine here that stocked allergy-friendly treats that I could go to, that I could trust, <laughs> that I could just get some snacks to get us through this four-hour stay here. And Charlie at that age looked at me and said, why don't you do it, Mum? Wow. And I looked at him and I said, oh, maybe, maybe I will. Um, but, you know, it's a bit too busy at the moment because I think I was pregnant with Arnold at that point in time and then Evelyn um, came along not long after Arnold. Um, but we always kept talking about it since then, this vending machine filled with allergy-friendly treats. What would we call the business? Um, what would the logo be like? And um, when we were in the US, I I kept thinking about it and I discussed it with some of the other allergy parents and they all said, oh, that would be amazing. Oh, and you could have it in hospitals and schools and airports. And it, I say, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so when we got back from the US, that's where Charlie said, are you going to start doing that business yet, mum? And I said, I guess I've got a bit more time because he was at school. I think Arnold was starting at kinder. Evelyn was, you know, a couple of hours a week at daycare. So I started exploring it more and we decided on the name Charlie Safe Treat Box because we had a Tupperware container at home that had a label Charlie Safe Treats and in it we would put um, safe treats that he could then take to birthday parties that, you know, had been triple checked we knew they were safe. Um, they were then fun things that he could eat at a party. Um, it also meant if my my mum uh, was coming over to babysit and, um, you know, if Charlie had eaten all the other safe food I'd had and he wanted something else, she knew she could go to this Charlie Safe Treat Tupperware box um, and he could pick something from there. So that's how we came up with the name. And then we started to... Um, I started to speak to somebody about the branding. I wanted it to be very inclusive um, across all ages. Uh, I didn't want it to screen food allergies because um, I didn't want there to be a chance if they're at school that people could get bullied if they went to get something from this vending machine. Um, food allergy kids often get bullied, actually. It's good yeah, yeah, it could make them that easy target. Um, so, yeah, we finally we finally had the website built, launched, and then I was supposed to be going to uh, Expo in Nashville for all vending machines. It's the one to go to, and I was going to pick the right vending machine because I also wanted um, the products that you, uh, that if you went to pick a product, you could actually check the ingredients through the vending machine before you bought it. So if you had food allergies outside of the top 10, you didn't have to put money in the machine to get the product out to check it <laughs> to find out it's not safe. So um, I had a vision there of what I wanted the vending machine to be. So the the flights and tickets were booked to go in May 2020 and then, of course, COVID happened and that just completely changed everything. So we ended up having to um, move our website onto a different platform and we created it to become an e-commerce store where people could buy uh, any of the treats that are free of the top 10 food allergens. We started with a treat box with mindfulness colouring on the outside too. Um, then we created a second box and then we had a third smaller box that kids could um, be given at a birthday party that would have top 10 allergen free treats, plus a little toy, plus, again, mindfulness colouring you can do on the outside. And now we've extended it to be able to have, um, you can buy individual snacks or the treat box. Um, 
all of the products are free of the top 10 food allergens. So we don't make those products ourselves. We source them from manufacturers. And for them to be approved to be listed on our website, uh, the manufacturer has to go through our approval process. So there's a questionnaire that they have, which is about 100 different questions covering all um, areas of risk that they would have in manufacturing the product from the ingredients um, supplies that they source from uh, to the manufacturing equipment, to the training of the staff, to the packaging of the products, to other products that could be made in the uh, factory, um, to where the staff eat their foods and, you know, all the areas of risk where we know that's how contamination could happen. So um, it was a bit scary sending them out to companies because, particularly when you're just starting a business and you don't have any sales and you're asking a business to go through all these extra steps to approve the product. Um, and some companies won't do it. And they're not the right companies for us because we want people who are on board of making sure these products are safe for people with life-threatening food allergies. And the right companies love what we do. They get that questionnaire completed. They give it a... Um, uh, additional documentation um, and, yeah, they're a dream to work with and they get it. There will still always be an element of risk. We cannot, <laughs> you know, sort of say we guarantee it's um, never going to be free of those allergens. Sometimes with manufacturing there's always that slight risk, but these are the companies that have got all of the right steps and processes in place to make sure it's safe. These companies, uh, they don't have any may contain traces warning on their products either. You know, that's one of my annoyances and probably for many allergy parents, a product will say it's, you know, uh, free from all of these allergies or it's not in the ingredients list, that there'll be another statement somewhere on the packaging saying may contain traces of milk, egg, wheat, peanuts, tree nuts. Um, it's like, well, is it safe or is it not safe? I don't know now. Uh, so the companies that we align with are the ones that don't have those warnings on it because they don't need to. They've done all the checks. They're not putting it on there just to protect themselves legally. Um, yeah. So, yeah, we're, we're now open with our e-commerce store so people all across Australia can order the products, get them delivered to their door, which was another uh, frustration for me as an allergy mum. I knew the products that were safe for Charlie, but they weren't all available at the one store. So I would have to sometimes put a day aside to uh, put a day aside to drive to where all these stores were. And I'm based in Melbourne, you know, I'm not in a regional area in Australia. So I might have to drive 40 minutes to that store to find if they've got that safe product in stock. And sometimes it wouldn't be in stock at that point. Um, but I knew that there was a lot of time wasted. And, you know, if I went back to full-time work, I wouldn't have that time to drive to these locations. And I know there's a lot of allergy families where they're in full-time work. They don't have that spare time to do it. So the convenience of being able to order it online and get it delivered to your door and know someone else has done all those checks is like, oh, this is amazing. This is so easy now. Um yeah, but we always say every product will have the ingredients listed on the back. Follow the golden rule. Yes, we've done all of these checks for you, but make sure you do best practice and you check it yourself as well. Um, some people have allergies outside of those 10 most common allergens. And um, we still, if somebody asks us to check, we can go back to those manufacturers and say, does your product contain you know, strawberries or um, coconut or kiwi fruit. And because we've started this process with the manufacturers and they understand our customers, it's very easy for them to um, know the, the criteria and just how careful we are. So, you know, for some of those people, we've had to say, look, the products are made with actual real fruits. And if it says you know, it's strawberry flavored, it does contain strawberries. So, but they're just the questions that people want to know so they can make a decision for themselves. That's amazing, Sharon. That's really um, what the whole world needs. And it, it's amazing for you guys to have been the, at the forefront of this conversation with the manufacturers. Uh, but on top of that, you also have established um, a support group for, for parents 
That yeah. was one of your last initiatives and yes. mindfulness cards. Can you tell us about that? Yes. So I think if you are in the food allergy space, you know that um, it's not just about avoiding the food allergy or doing a treatment for the food allergy. There is a big mental and emotional side to this. Um, and a lot of it can come from being excluded, from being misunderstood in the wider community. Um, excluded at birthday parties, it could be excluded at family you know, extended events, um, excluded at school when there's food-based events. Um, and so through that, uh, Charlie and I worked together to come up with some affirmation cards for kids with food allergies and then affirmation cards for allergy mums. Because one thing I do know is that this um, heavy burden typically falls on the allergy mum's shoulders to keep her child safe, to advocate for her child, to do the right um, appointments with allergists, to find the safe foods, um, to yeah, cook the safe food, all of it. And it's a heavy burden and it's really lonely. Um, and so I wanted to somehow reach out to those allergy mums where they can buy these affirmation cards and they can look at them at home and know that they've been um, designed and created by an allergy mum who has gone through the same experience, is going still through the same experience. So, uh, and then the other part is through through being the founder um, of Charlie Safe Treat Box, I have a lot of chats behind the scenes with so many allergy mums and it's a constant um, theme that comes through of, um, I'm so glad you've shared your story, Sharon. I do the same things and it makes me feel so much better that um, it's not just me. <laughs> you know, I was questioning myself, maybe I'm doing the wrong thing, but now I know you do that too and other allergy families do. It gives me a lot more confidence. Um, they talk about, you know, feeling lonely, about the struggles of it, about their worries, about their concerns and tips and recommendations and experiences as well. And so I started thinking, well, this is of no um, benefit to everybody else when I'm the only one that can can see, you know, this beautiful thing that's being created behind the scenes. And the worst um, thing for me is to know that there's an allergy mum out there who really is by herself. There's allergy mums where their kid is the only kid with food allergies at the school. There is nobody else around to help advocate and support them um, they need a group like this where they can find their voice where they can um, listen to other people's experiences where they can share challenges that they've gone through and we can all come together and help talk about it and problem solve and discuss it um, because there are some you know some platforms out there and some groups out there but there's a specialist that comes in um, you get to submit your questions beforehand and um, you walk away and you still haven't been able to speak to anybody about it. And I wanted to change that because we are specialists. You know, allergy mums are specialists in what we do. We, we don't give ourselves that credit. And I think if we come together as a group, um, we, can really, we can really change the experience for us going forward that it doesn't need to be lonely anymore. We've got a group that we can go to who we can support each other. Um, for people who might have, um, you know, allergies outside of the top 10 where it's a little bit more rare, a bit more uncommon, there's a chance you'll connect with another family who have that same allergy and suddenly, you know, you can share your experiences through that. Um, I've done that recently. Um, it was two families where uh, they're, child is allergic to um, citrus seeds they'd never met anybody else <laughs> but you know there's been that connection made now and the the children are different ages but it's still the whole wow I didn't think anybody else had that same allergy this is really great to know um it's very so we're it's just hard. starting uh in this space so um we can have yeah other allergy mums join but we'll see what happens. Like I'd love it to grow as a platform. Um, for me, myself, I'd love to have some sort of membership there where 
there's a portal that you can go into, um, yeah, where there's, you know, uh, so many things tailored to uh, giving you solutions or tools that you can use as you go along that allergy journey. Um, whether it's, you know, breathing exercises, whether it's role playing and using your voice and learning how to speak confidently when you're advocating for your child. Um, yeah, there's so many things that I've got bubbling in my mind. I've got a list of things and all these experts that I've spoken to, I've contacted because of Charlie Safe Treat Box that I'm like, oh, that would be really interesting for the allergy community in Australia. Oh, this is actually your new project. Can it be? Yeah, it is. It is, isn't it? And, um, you know, and we'd still love to get back to our vending machines. So, you know, I, for that part, I really need to find people who, where there's grants available or who can help fund it. Um, so we can get that part of Charlie Safe Treat Box out and um, into the community and just providing that safe place for people to go and get treats. Sharon, thank you so much for being such a wonderful, honest um, advocate for all of us, food allergy parents, for also talking honestly about Dr. Jones's international protocol and how effective it has been for your family and hundreds of um, Australian families and thousands of others. Um, just to say it is available through Immunity Group Australia now in Australia in a very limited capacity. We wish that every GP was able to offer food-based program like that and, and we will work towards that. Um, and we wish you a lot of success and um, the expansion of your work in the food allergy advocacy space. And perhaps um, next time we can even hear from Charlie himself. Yeah, well, that would be another part to hear from yeah the kids who have done the treatment and he will tell you he hates food allergies, he hates OIT, but he also knows what it's brought for him in his life in terms of food allergy freedom. And that is irreplaceable. Hmm. Thank you so much. We'll see you next time. <laughs> Thank you.